when you have no fiscal space and you try to and you fire your bazooka, what you get is an explosion in inflation. And how do we know we have no fiscal space left? Because we just did it. Yeah. We just did it and we had the inflation. And so the next time there's an emergency, there's the next time there's a need, uh, we're going to see that we're going to see a repeat of that and probably a, a somewhat worse episode than this last one. And then we're going to have to get religion and get our fiscal house in order. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. We've had two excellent years of returns in the stock market. Can that winning streak continue into 2025? Also, in less than a week, we should know who the next president of the United States is. How should investors alter their positions based upon who the winner is? For answers, we're gonna find out how the big players, those managing tens of billions of dollars in client capital, are allocating their portfolios right now. We'll also ask, what can the regular retail investor learn from their strategies? To find out, we're fortunate to welcome Chris Brightman to the program today. Chris is the CEO and CIO of Research Affiliates, and along with Rob Arnett, he's co-portfolio manager on the PIMCO All Asset and All Asset All Authority funds, as well as the PIMCO RAE funds. To give you a sense of the impressive scope of Chris's work, around $150 billion worth of assets are managed worldwide using investment strategies developed by research affiliates. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. My pleasure. It's such a pleasure to have you back on, Chris. I think this is your first time on the new Thoughtful Money channel. Um, it's wonderful to have you on. You look great. Lots to talk about. Um, before we get into the specifics, can I just ask you the um, intentionally broad question? I like to kick these discussions off, off with. Um, what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Uh, I am very optimistic about the uh, global economy. Uh, and uh, I have mixed views on uh, financial markets. Um, the uh, pace of innovation uh, both broadly as well as within our industry, I think is accelerating. And that's much to the benefit of humanity in general, uh, but also uh, to investors um, as well. Uh, so I'm you know, kind of very bullish on what's going on in the economy. On um, financial markets, uh, I think there's lots of wonderful opportunity and lots of uh, opportunity to uh, improve uh, investors' outcomes. Um, having said that, for uh, U.S. investors with uh, heavily home-biased, uh, equity-centric portfolios, uh, I think the present valuations suggest a disappointing uh, decade to come. Um, you can count me as being sympathetic to the views recently expressed by Goldman. Okay. Um, I was literally just about to mention that. So we, we've had a number of analysts on this program um, for years, in the past several years, warning about valuation risk. And um, we're going to be joined after you speak today, Chris, um, from the by the folks from New Harbor Financial. Um, they often will pull up the work of folks like John Hussman, um, who will you know has very detailed charts that show, hey, when we've reached valuation levels like this. Extremes like this, forward returns tend to be very low for the coming decade. I think the specific chart that that Hussman has is a 12-year forecast, and I think he actually has a negative average market return over that period of time. Goldman, I believe, came out relatively recently with sort of a similar message, not quite as dire, but I think they said something like uh, maybe average of 3% returns over the next 10 years, given how rich valuations are right now. Am, am I remembering generally? Yes, and the 3% uh, is a nominal number. So if you picked a very round number for inflation of 2%, that would be a 1% real return. And um, that's consistent with our central tendency expectation for the US stock market as well, about a 3% a nominal return, 2% uh, real return assuming there's considerable mean reversion towards historical norms in valuation. Specifically, we assume that uh, uh, market prices will revert halfway to their historical uh, uh, 
normal relationship in in terms of uh, the, the Schiller PE. Okay, so wh why don't we why don't we start? And, and let me just mention too that Schiller PE is is quite elevated now. It's not at at the highest it's ever been, but I think the last time I saw it was at like thirty six or thirty seven. It, it, it's it's surpassed only by uh, the you know, very late nineteen nineties uh, tech bubble and the uh, nineteen twenty nine period. So we're okay. at. We're not at the all-time high, <laughs> but we're in that kind of uh, range, yeah. Okay. So why don't we approach this from the bull side for a moment? So what's the argument to say, ah, we shouldn't worry about this. It's different this time. Well, I think that uh, you, you you hit the nail on the head. It is it, 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 The argument would be it's different this time. And the uh, reason that it's different is because the uh, growth in earnings per share has been uh, phenomenal. Uh, and there doesn't appear at present to be any uh, rotation or change, inflection point in the historically uh, unusual period of uh, not just American exceptionalism, it does show up as an exceptional uh, outlier, the US uh, uh, stock market, not just in terms of its total return performance, but its growth in real earnings per share. Uh, and of course, that's not uh, widely uh, distributed. It's heavily mm -hmm. concentrated in whatever you want to call them, uh, tech platform companies or uh, you know, hyperscalers or the mag seven, uh, we know who we're talking about. And um, uh, that, you know, look at Google's numbers uh, 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 that were just released. There doesn't seem to be uh, any uh, uh, end in sight to that trend. So long as that trend, that real earnings per share growth trend continues, uh, I think uh, very strong equity market returns will uh, uh, continue as well. The reason to suspect that might not is that every time in history that that has appeared to be the case before it turned out not to be different mm -hmm. okay so bull argument is we're going to grow our way into these valuation multiples and uh nothing stops this train you know over the next 10 years we're just going to see continued uh and let me just add that this is very different than what we saw in the late 1990s there was not the long history of exceptional growth and earnings per share of the companies that were sporting absurd valuations. We're not, you know, these uh, uh, today's magnificent seven companies aren't pets.com that are being inflated right. by nothing more than a sock puppet and a, yeah. There's actually earnings to put a multiple on. Yeah, right, right. And earnings that have been growing. Right, the remarkable part is not the multiples, the remarkable part is the earnings growth. Okay. Um, so first off, you, you mentioned something I just want to clarify um, that that the earnings growth is not evenly distributed um, amongst uh, the, the market. Uh, in fact, I saw a stat and, I, and I, I might be sort of misremembering the quarter. I can't remember if it was Q3 of 2024 or if it's expected uh, earnings to the quarter of Q3 2025. But 100% of the growth in earnings was expected to come from just those magnificent seven stocks. That basically the remaining 493 of the S&P 500 were net earnings contraction. <laughs> I, I have not seen that statistic, but it doesn't surprise me. Okay. All right. So um, if it really comes down to, okay, we're going to be able to continue to, to um, grow earnings uh, at the rate we are, well, we would need robust economic growth. Right, we would need probably maintaining or improving corporate profits from here in both cases. Uh, as you look out at both, um, I mean, obviously you, you see some challenges there, or else you wouldn't be your your firm wouldn't be projecting uh, that uh, uh, valuations will will begin to mean correct. Um, but what are you know? So the U.S. economy, I think, has probably surprised people um, in its its resilience in terms of how GDP has grown. On the day we're talking, uh, we just got the latest numbers for uh, Q2 GDP, I believe. Um, and uh, uh, no, sorry, Q3 GDP. And uh, I think the um, GDP, at least the GDP now forecast just dropped. Um, I think it was a little bit over three. It's somewhere down to 2.7, 2.8 right now. I think you're nodding. Um, 
So who knows? I mean, too early to, to say that there's maybe some sort of trend of, of downshifting there. But if we look at um, other parts of the economy, um, you know, we, we do see a lot of concerning signs. I mean, the consumer definitely seems to be struggling here. Um, it's, you know, we can see that everything from sort of anemic retail sales on a, on a real basis, um, we can certainly see that in terms of, uh, you know, consumers beginning to show signs of being tapped out in terms of being able to add additional um, uh, revolving credit to the home balance sheet. Um, we're definitely seeing, uh, you know, lots of consumer brands struggling and and citing in their earnings forecasts, uh, hey, the reason why we're ratcheting down our, our, our future expectations is because we're hearing from consumers that they're having to downshift. We're even starting to see that in some of the luxury brands. Um, so LVMH, which owns a lot of big luxury brands, just sort of issued a warning on this. I think on the day we're talking, Campari, which is a big beverage company, uh, is also citing weak consumer demand. And, and a lot of people think, you know, alcohol, you know, companies are maybe even a, uh, you know, they might do well in times of, of economic hardship because people are turning <laughs> to drinking more to drink their troubles away. But even those those companies are, are, are showing some uh, concerning signs here. So I guess where I'm going with this, Chris, is um, if, if robust economic growth and uh, similar or higher corporate profits are going to be needed to kind of keep the train going, the party going for the next decade from here, um, how concerned are you about the future of the economy, given either some of the signs I mentioned or other ones that your firm tracks? Um, boy, a lot of a uh, lot of uh, different dimensions. Sorry, that, packed uh, a lot question. into that question. I'm sorry. So let yes. me see here. Um, yes, the if you look at the reports that come out of the Congressional Budget Office or CBO, as it's sometimes called, the uh, assumed secular real growth rate for the U.S. economy is about two percent, and so being closer to three than two, 2.8 percent was, I think, the most recent, you know, initial likely to be revised observation of uh, quarterly uh, GDP growth in the U.S., and that's a real number. That's above trend uh, or above the estimate of long-term secular growth. So we're, we're, we're doing quite well. Uh, I believe, and I've written about this, that uh, the reason that we have been uh, exceeding that uh, estimate of secular long-term real growth for the U.S. economy is growth of the labor force. And the reason that the labor force has been growing more than official forecasts is immigration. Uh, and um, the uh, immigration, of course, is largely, unfortunately, illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. And not only is that not uh, the best way to uh, manage immigration for the economy, it also is uh, poisonous to our politics. So we we really do need to get control of the border and and uh, I stem the flow. I mean, it's never going to be zero, but we really need to reduce it. Um, now, you ask, you know, what's my view uh, looking forward is whether the economy will slow. Well, I, I think, yes, it will. And all you have to do is look at the very recent uh, numbers of border apprehensions and the, and the estimates. And it's always estimates because we just don't, you can't know the real number of people that are coming in illegally. Uh, uh, we, we don't, we don't have the ability to observe and count that. So you have to, you have to, estimated. But, um, you know, we, we can see the huge discrepancy between what the uh, Census Bureau estimates based upon their methodology of counting noses uh, and what the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics ob observes, which is job growth. And, um, and we've had a huge influx to our labor force. And that's why the U.S. appears to be an exception and an outlier among other developed countries is this, this increase. Uh, you know, part of uh, a real GDP growth is increase in the labor force. And the other part is increase in labor productivity. Mostly what's been surprising to the upside is the increase in the labor force. But that 
the 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 whether you um, want to give them any credit or not, and I, I'm kind of indifferent on that. Uh, uh, the current administration has clamped down recently, and I don't see us going back to the you know first three years of the Biden administration. I just don't think our populace will tolerate that level of illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. We absolutely need immigration, uh, but it, it, it needs to be and will be legal immigration. And that's a huge strength for our country looking forward. One of the reasons that I'm kind of very long-term bullish on the U.S. economy and the U.S. place in the world in the 21st century. Yeah, in, in many ways, um, uh, to turn a weakness into a strength, which is um, you know, the weakness is, as Elon Musk likes to say, is our border is not with Canada and Mexico, it's with the world, right? There's just so many people that want to come here. Uh, and, and right now, we've been having a, a much higher flood of illegal immigration than I think you know anybody has wanted. But I'd like uh, to turn that around. I'd say that actually that's our strength and not our weakness. Well that's that's what I was saying is that you're turning a weakness into a strength. So you, you have that, but but you know if you, you get the immigration policy right and, and you're figuring out, you know, okay, we let's take that global demand to come in and let's bring it in the way in the way that best serves the economy and society. That's a massive right. strength. Yeah, totally agree. Um I, I so a couple of things. One, um so do you do you look at then um, as immigration policy is almost like the federal funds rate? In other words, like just like we would we would raise the federal funds rate to try to decrease economic growth, if we slow the pace of bodies coming into the country, legal or illegal, that would almost act like a like a break on the economy. We wouldn't see as much economic growth because we're diminishing the flow in. No. Um... I think the 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 difference is between cyclical variation and long term secular trends. Um, when we're talking about uh, the path of the funds, the Fed funds rate, mostly people are thinking in cyclical terms. You know, is the Fed going to cut? How many times is the Fed going to cut the the Fed funds rate between now and year end, or bit during the calendar year of 2025? And all that's a discussion of using traditional, you know, neo Keynesian uh, 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 policy to try to fine tune the business cycle. Um, when we talk about the growth of the labor force, we're looking at uh, a, a secular trend that unfolds over many decades, not a, a tool that can uh, be used to manage the um, the business cycle. Um, I, I, I suppose in theory, I suppose you could. I think it's just very improbable that we would be able to uh, turn that dial as an effective uh, tool for managing the uh, business cycle. I mean, this is not something that you can, um, uh, or, or I, I think it's not something that we will uh, delegate to a nonpartisan body like the Fed. Fed, yeah. Uh, and uh, to expect Congress to be tweaking the uh, rate of legal immigration to fine tune the business cycle seems implausible to me. Okay, and, and let, let me let me tell you why I asked the question, which is. Um, if you think that uh, economic growth has been higher and uh, higher than trend um, in large reason because we've had uh, more laborers coming into the country, mostly illegally, but but just more laborers coming into the country. Right. And now the current administration has reduced that. Right. Even if the current administration gets reelected next month, next week, um, you don't see them going back to the levels that we we've had over the past couple of years. Obviously, if Trump gets elected, he's promise to really clamp down on things. So right. my, my question was more, do you expect sort of a lag effect, meaning, okay, if we're turning off, if we're, if we're reducing the flow, do you expect to see that reflected in slower economic growth at some point in the future? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think uh, like next quarter, um, uh, because the, you know, there's a lag because, you know, this is illegal immigration. So these people don't actually have the right to work in the United States. They find ways to work. And it's yeah. probably a good thing. I mean, you know, uh, um, I, I don't really expect that we're going to be successful, even if we try to uh, identify the full extent of uh, people who are undocumented or illegal, whatever your preferred term is, 
and um, immediately or even expeditiously um, deport all of them. Uh, and if they're hanging around here, you'd rather them be, you know, contributing uh, 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 to 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 work and to paying taxes and uh, uh, rather than just being idle. Um, uh, and so it takes some time for them to come into the economy. So I don't think this is like turning a switch. But regardless, I, my my read is the Democrats have learned their lesson that if they were to uh, go back to the rate of illegal immigration in the first three years of the administration, they know that they would lose you know, support. They may have already lost support now. And certainly Trump's not, you know, a, a, a Trump administration is not going in that direction. So, you know, what, what the lag time is, is highly uncertain. But, but that the flow of Ill illegal immigrants has already slowed and is not going to resume, I think means that that period of above trend real economic growth is going to be dissipating. And we could, absent a recession, we should expect it to settle down more like 2% rather than 3%. Okay. So in addition to some of the risks that I mentioned, like, you know, the consumer getting tapped out and that type of stuff, um, which could reflect in slower economic growth because our economy is 70% consumer spending, we also could see a reflection in slower economic growth because of the tightening that we have on the immigration flow into the U.S., yeah, I think that's a that's a very high confidence uh, forecast. Now, I want to I want to uh, make the point though that tells you very little about corporate earnings. Yes, yes. Um, all right. Well, look. Um, with actually, I want to ask you about corporate earnings, um, but real quick, just to let folks know that the whole immigration subject is a uh, it's it's a very complex and nuanced one. It's one that that most Americans report not really feeling like they've got the facts on. Just want to remind folks, if you haven't watched it yet, um, I did what I consider to be a very important interview with the Center for Immigration Studies a couple of weeks back um, on the immigration situation, how the legal system works, what's happening on the illegal side. Um, it is uh, it, it definitely the, the, the best attempt I could make at doing this in a nonpartisan, um, respectful, just the facts uh, approach. Uh, and so anyways, if you haven't watched that yet, it's an important one to, to um, get educated on. Go to thoughtfulmoney.com slash immigration to learn more about it. One may thing may I, to, since, yeah. since, since we're um, um, providing uh, plugs. Uh, uh, Plug away. <laughs> uh, allow me to note that um, a month or two ago, I published uh, an article on our site, researchaffiliates.com uh, called Change Required. Uh, that uh, explains uh, the points that uh, I've discussed with a lot of data and graphs and links to uh, thoughtful uh, studies. Um, and, 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 you know, we do need change. And uh, as, as I said, we, we need legal immigration. And, and of course, we need to cease, which we may have already largely done, the illegal immigration. All right. Um, fantastic. Do me a favor, if you can, Chris, can you send me that link afterwards? Because one, I'd love to read it. But two, also, folks, put a link to that in the description below this video so that anybody who wants to read it can just get there with one click. Um, all right. So you said, hey, uh, don't expect this to get um, reflected in corporate profits anytime soon. So when you look at corporate profits going forward, you know, on average, they've been doing great, as we've talked about earlier. Um, when you when you look out right now with your lens on corporate profits, what trends are you generally expecting to see? Um, so the first thing that I want to uh, remind uh, people of is the very loose and tenuous link between GDP growth and equity market returns. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of an implicit assumption that seems very logical to people that if you knew what GDP growth was going to be uh, in the future, that would give you a great edge in uh, investing in the stock market. And my uh, studies over the decades uh, have taught me that that's just, just not true. Um, one... Uh, one um, relationship that some find surprising is that if you create a scatter plot of 
uh, GDP growth and equity market returns for long periods of time and countries across the world, you find that the relationship is actually a bit negative. Countries with higher GDP growth tend to have had uh, or have had, just factually, empirically, have had lower equity market returns than countries with lower GDP growth. Interesting. And so I, I just caution uh, uh, not to make the mistake that uh, um, uh, what's happening in the economy uh, is uh, going to determine what happens in happens the stock in the market. They're just two very, very different realms. Uh, and uh, 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 the, the even even corporate earnings are um, it, if we were to look at earnings growth, like total profits growth, you would see a strong relationship to the a size of a, the economy. But we're not looking at uh, uh, corporate profit growth. We're looking in growth per share, and that's you know kind of more analogous to uh, um, productivity growth. But even productivity growth at the country level doesn't term determine the earnings per share growth of a company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a, a TMSC in Taiwan. In no way is uh, the uh, revenue and the resulting profits and growth and earnings per share of uh, 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 TMSC uh, um, tied to the uh, Taiwanese economy, nor are, you know, Nestle's profits tied to the growth of the Swiss economy mm -hmm. or Royal Dutch Shell's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, growth tied to the Netherlands. Um, and, um, you know, we're a big economy and so it's a little different, but again, I don't think Google or Facebook or uh, NVIDIA's uh, profits are tightly linked to U.S. economic growth. Okay, interesting. And um, is is that just because that's the way it is? Is that because most of those brands you just mentioned are large multinationals, and so they're not dependent on any one national economy, uh, but on the conglomerate of, of economies? Um, what's your answer there, or your, at least your instincts there? Well, it depends upon we're talking about a market aggregate or an individual company. For an individual company, you know, what goes on in an individual company is probably more to do with their competition uh, 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 within their uh, industry or their sector. Yeah, uh, that, you're right. That makes total sense. Uh, uh, if you're talking about uh, um, a um, economy, if you're talking about country equity markets, look at the proportion of the profits that S&P 500 companies make outside of the US, it's enormous, much, much greater. So it, it, you know, the US is a, is a very large economy, a very low proportion of trade uh, in the US versus other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's not true for uh, uh, the publicly traded companies in the uh, uh, large cap part of our stock market. They are, they are mostly operating on a, on a global uh, uh, scale. Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, the U.S. is a large part of the global economy. So as goes the U.S. economy, so goes the global economy. But again, we're not seeing companies including Apple and Microsoft and uh, Alphabet and Facebook growing their top line revenues at the growth rate of US GDP growth. They're, they're doing phenomenally well, not because the US economy grows at 2.8% versus 2%. They're doing phenomenally well because their top line's growing at 15%. And that 15% is not a function of whether U.S. prints 2.8 or 2 on uh, real GDP growth. Okay. Um, guys, I, I, I've got questions I'm trying to get to, but you keep throwing really interesting things uh, into the mix here. Yeah. Okay. Last question, then we'll get to uh, to the election. Um, I just want to make sure I understood your, your main point correctly, where a lot of people, and I think understandably so, and like the logic makes sense, is... Yeah, if the economy is doing better, 
then the stock market will do better, right? And people have compared it as the economy is the dog and the markets are the tail, right? And then sometimes people will say, oh, you know, actually, you know, in, in this cycle we're in, it seems like the market, the tail is wagging the dog, right? And I think I hear what you're saying is, is don't think of it as like a dog and a tail. Think of them as like a dog and a cat. <laughs> they're, they're really empirically not that connected and they're just two very different things. I think that's exactly right. And um, um, let's get the direction of the relationships correct. Um, markets are forward looking and forward discounting. So if uh, you, if I was an economist uh, and I was interested in predicting what's going to happen to the economy, uh, uh, changes in market prices would be an important input to my model mm -hmm. uh, because markets lead the economy. But uh, as an investor, uh, trying to alter my uh, course based upon uh, the information that comes out about the economy is like trying to steer your car by staring in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, all right. Well, look, um, I could keep digging into this forever, but I got a couple of really important questions I want to get to with you. Uh, a big one being in less than a week now, hopefully we will know who the next president of the United States is. Hopefully we're not embroiled in another national prolonged national debate. Um, I imagine that um, you, from an allocation standpoint, a recommended allocation standpoint, you'd probably, your company probably has some differences depending upon who wins this election. Is that true? And if so, what are those allocation differences? Um, well, first of all, I know uh, people are interested in, is there a trade for the election? And for us, the answer to that question is yes. We've studied the subject and we have uh, observed some empirical relationships, specifically that the month following a presidential election tends to be a pretty good month for the stock market. Let's call it the, you know, 20 trading days following an election tend to be better than average. Uh, and that effect is magnified if it's a close election. Uh, and the reason we believe is not very mysterious that when the election is over, there's a winner. And when the winner is declared, uh, that dissipates uncertainty. Markets right. don't like uncertainty. So that dissipation of uncertainty tends to, historically, it's just empirical fact, uh, looking at all the elections since uh, World War II, that that tends to be a pretty good time for the stock market. So we would be a little longer the U.S. equity market than otherwise, in fact, are. Uh, uh, um, uh, and Interestingly, that uh, empirical relationship seems to begin about uh, a week or five trading days before the election because people are putting on the trade. Other people right. see the same facts we are, and it's not uh, uh, hard to figure out that uh, there's a sort of a relief rally, uh, uh, uncertainty dissipates, and there's a, there's a nice little pop in the stock market that uh, occurs in the month following uh, the results of the election. Having said all of that, I think there's a interesting wrinkle in the um, current environment. Specifically, the only way that I see uncertainty dissipating is a concession by Kamala Harris. If I don't, if there's a blue wave or a red wave, we may know the end, the, the, the results of the election, you know, if we stay up late uh, on Tuesday. Uh, uh, but I think more likely, at least the according to the people who study this more closely than I do, more likely uh, they're going to be continuing to vote, count uh, absentee ballots in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin for a couple of days following the election. So it, we, we probably won't know until, you know, I don't know, Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or something like that. Um, irrespective of the day that the AP calls the election. Um, I think if they call it for Trump, 
uh, the Harris uh, campaign, uh, uh, Kamala Harris her herself, will concede the election and call Trump and congratulate him. But the reverse, reverse is probably not true. If the AP calls the election for Harris, I don't expect uh, Trump to concede and call uh, Kamala Harris and congratulate her on uh, uh, her win. And uh, you can imagine for yourself what kind of situation we might be in should the AP call the election for Harris and Trump decides not to concede. I would just say that whatever that scenario looks like, it doesn't, I wouldn't bet that that would be a dissipation of uncertainty. So I, I think you, it's an interesting trade to put on and I would do a stop loss and get out if anything other than Harris concedes, uh, 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 you know, I, you know, by the end of the week, next week, not the end of this week, obviously, the end of next week. So there's, okay. there, there's our trade. Okay. I totally get it. All right. So that's short term, obviously. Yep. So, um, whether we have a Harris administration after whatever process we have to go through ends or a Trump administration, um, how do you look at allocating differently for the next four years of those administrations? Well, um, I've already uh, mentioned that I think people often um, get too wrapped up in trying to use economic uh, um, events as a reason for investing. There's, you know, there are signals that help you, uh, it probably, uh, as you well know, most of your investors uh, uh, would be very wise uh, to hold diversified portfolios of low cost ETFs and tune out all this noise and yep. keep themselves from doing lots of trading. Um, uh, um, uh, but if they are going to be uh, paying attention to the news and trading based upon uh, what they what they hear or what they read, um, um, the economy. To to repeat what I said before is like trying to drive your portfolio by staring in the rearview mirror. Um, what uh, I, I think there is a, a a huge issue that I worry about though, and I think it does have uh, capital market implications, and that's the unsustainable level of debt that we have, along mm -hmm. with the unsustainable level of um, deficit spending. It's deficit not spending. just that we have debt to GDP uh, at 100%, which is scary, but that we're running 7% of GDP deficits for as far as the eye can see, or actually growing in the out years, with a booming economy. We are, we are, we are, uh, uh, unemployment is below what you would expect as a normal rate of unemployment. We just talked about at the beginning of uh, our conversation that our GDP growth is above uh, estimates of its long-term potential. And, and it's been that way for quite some time. Uh, uh, we should be paying down the debt in, in a booming economy like this. And instead we're running 7% of, of GDP deficits. Uh, and that, make no mistake in the short run on a cyclical basis inflates corporate profits um on the long run it's not good for corporate profits um but uh, but in the short run uh that's creating a uh, uh, kind of an abnormal uh, growth in corporate profits that that deficit spending and it has to end and it will end uh i don't think that it will be either uh, the person of Donald Trump or the person of Kamala Harris that's going to come up with the plan for getting our fiscal house in order, but uh, but but it, but it will and it has to, and 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 I'm I'm, I'm not uh, I'm, I I I want to be clear. I'm very optimistic. We will do the right thing. Uh, we <laughs> haven't yet, uh, but we will. And it's it's a political problem. It's not an economic problem. The U.S. Right. is extraordinarily strong economy. Our government spending is uh, very low compared to most other developed countries. It, it just should not be a problem to properly manage the finances of an economy that this is this healthy. But we do have to make changes. And, and if we don't, we'll, we'll, we'll see some, 
difficult capital market environment. You know, uh, your, your, your listeners understand. We'll see inflation, we'll see rising interest rates, we'll see a falling dollar, et cetera. Again, I'm confident we'll do the right thing so that any 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 problems of that sort will be modest and and uh, uh, remedied. Uh, but, but, but that's coming, make no mistake. Okay, so um, what I hear in your words there are echoes of uh, Winston Churchill's famous comment about, I love Americans. You can always count on them to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other possible option, right? So, um, you know, it sounds like you think, hey, we'll, we'll get our house in order eventually, but we're probably going to get to that pain point, right, where um, we refuse to change our behavior until the pain of continuing the status quo starts to exceed the pain of change. Um, yes, yeah, so I wrote an to... article on that subject in January, and the end of the article said that we're just exhausting our, our alternatives, that that, okay. the, that the U.S. always makes the right decision in the end after exhausting all of its alternatives. All, all others, yeah. And uh, we are exhausting all of our alternatives. The the the, the voters keep telling uh, Washington that what they want is more benefits from the government, but not to pay any taxes. And the government is the politicians are trying their best to do what the voters ask them to do, which is give them more government benefits and cut their taxes. Um, but uh, that 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 can't continue and it won't. Okay. So I think a lot of the viewers here are saying, sing it, brother. You know, they they've they they see this movie playing out. The big question they've been asking themselves, which admittedly nobody can answer definitively. So I'm not putting that pressure on you, but is when? When is all this going to matter? Right. And I think people in general are worried about the 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 process of hitting the end of the road where the can can't be kicked anymore. And a lot of these things that you just mentioned, higher inflation, turmoil in the capital markets go on, and they just don't want to become collateral damage uh, during that period of, of transition to hopefully the right doing the right thing. Um, so uh, I'm not going to ask you for a date necessarily, but like if this were a, a ball game, you know, kind of what inning are we in in exhausting our options? Um, or even just are we still at the beginning? Are we in the middle? Are we near the end? Oh, we're, we're past the seventh inning stretch. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I hear that and I would say something like, okay, if there's a reckoning, sounds like we, you think we might hit it before the end of the next administration, right? So no matter who that, wins. That, uh, you know, it, I, I'd say that we are going, my assessment is that we're quite likely to encounter some substantial turbulence with the next recession. Is it for that uh, there will be a recession in the next uh, uh, four years. Um, no, it's it's um, it's it's um, within the uh, realm of reasonable probability that uh, whoever, whatever administration comes into power um, uh, in January of 2025, will enjoy a full four years of strong economic growth and no recession. I would wouldn't put that at a fifty percent odds, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, it's possible. Uh, the 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 reason that I'm worried about the next recession. I mean, of course, we always worry about recessions. Recessions are unpleasant for many people for many reasons, and there are different types of recessions. But uh, the reason that uh, we we should be concerned is that we have no fiscal space. I think um, the concept of fiscal space is something that people should acquaint themselves with. It's not hard to do. Just go to Google and say fiscal space uh, and hit go and then you know, read up about what fiscal space means. It basically means having the wherewithal, the, the, the ability to use fiscal and monetary policy to address a, an economic problem, whether that's a garden variety recession or a financial crisis. Um, it just is very nice to be able to increase government spending and to monetize uh, the debt that is created by that government spending um, uh, during a financial crisis or, a, or, or, or any other kind of um, recession. But when you don't have any space left, and 
I think the UK, it's really good to look at what's been happening with the UK lately. Remember when Liz Truss briefly was um, mm -hmm. prime minister and she came up with a budget that was just not realistic and boom, she didn't outlast the famous lettuce. Uh, that's because the right. UK has no fiscal space. And um, what happens with no fiscal space is when you try to implement uh, you know, get out the bazooka to solve the uh, economic problem, all that happens is you create inflation. And this concept was explained to me by John Cochran uh, at Stanford, formerly University of Chicago, who wrote the book on the fiscal theory of the price level. When you have no, and one of the, one of the absolute most brilliant economists of our age, not just my opinion, most people's opinion. Um, when you have no fiscal space and you try to, and you fire your bazooka, what you get is an explosion in inflation. And how do we know we have no fiscal space left? Because we just did it. Yeah. We just did it and we had the inflation. And so the next time there's an emergency, there's the next time there's a need, uh, we're going to see that, we're going to see a repeat of that and probably a, a, somewhat worse episode than this last one. And then we're gonna to have to get religion and get our fiscal house in order. And you won't want to be, you know, in, you know, it, it will be a difficult time for capital markets for, for, for a time, there'll be a, there'll be a correction. Uh, you won't want to be aggressively long during that time. Well, you know, this, I think the risks are more to the dollar and to government bond yields uh, than they are to equities. Equities are real assets over the long run. Uh, what gives me pause, though, and worry is the extended valuations, right? If you yeah. have, if you're at uh, a, a valuation for the U.S. stock market that is in the neighborhood of 1929 and 1999, and then there's a shock to the system, well, that could just be a catalyst for people looking at the, the prices that the, they're, they're paying for some of these things and saying, why did we ever think this made sense? Uh, this is crazy. And so uh, if, if, if you were buying the US stock market at a Schiller PE of 12, I would say, well, you know, the fiscal crisis, that's probably more of a risk for bond yields and and currencies than the stock market, but with the stock market priced the way it is, yeah, you're probably not going to be particularly safe in the stock market either. Okay. So what do you um, buy? You know, um, everybody you know wants to know that. Well, you might buy gold, but the uh, gold is pretty damn expensive because the Chinese central banks buying it as quickly as they can because you know they saw what happened to Russia and they don't want all of their U.S. dollar reserves confiscated. Right. Uh, so they're buying up gold. So gold's gotten pretty darn expensive. Uh, there's Bitcoin. I don't know if Bitcoin's expensive or cheap. I think it's kind of, you know, I don't, I don't know how to say fair value for Bitcoin, but personally, I don't do uh, crypto in my own account because I don't want to check that box on my tax return. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I think you're, you, you, you don't have to check that box, I guess, now to do the futures contracts or the ETFs or whatnot. Right. Um, uh, but but generally speaking, what I'm more comfortable with is real assets. You know, houses aren't going to get less valuable uh, because there's a bit of a, a recession. And a, I mean, you know, there might be a correction a little bit, but, the, you know, we don't have enough houses. Uh, uh, um, and, you know, while there's the, the, the last shoe hasn't dropped yet in office REITs, uh, I still think that, uh, you know, REITs are probably a, a decent sector to be in if we have a, another inflationary episode. Um, okay. And um, there's all manner of other, you know, kind of real assets that people, tips are probably better than nominal bonds. All right. I was going to ask you about that. Because the last time we talked, which admittedly was a while ago, you were pretty bullish on tips. So it seems like you still think they're still, still wise to look at. Yeah, not because you're going to get rich buying tips at today's tips yields, uh, but because I think that the you're clipping off the left tail of the distribution. Okay. In other words, they're they're a safe investment. Uh, they're gonna they 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 will do a better job of protecting your capital. You're, uh, the you're not going to your capital. Yeah. yeah, you're not going to be earning you know fifteen percent compound a year uh, owning tips. You'll yeah. get two. Yeah, um, but but obviously too, you won't have a hopefully won't have a 
20% plus down year in a bad year, like we saw in 2022 for a lot of equities. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, I always advise people to have well diversified uh, portfolios, but if you're in a circumstance today that um, you have a heavily U.S. centric equity oriented portfolio, uh, great. You've done fantastically terrific. Uh, <laughs> now might be a time to diversify a little bit, uh, uh, reduce U.S. Uh, stocks and U.S. nominal bonds, uh, diversify a little bit into uh, other countries. Europe's very cheap. Um, India, not so much. Uh, uh, China, I, it's a little risky for me. Um, um, but um, but uh, diversify internationally and then also uh, into real assets. I think. Okay. That don't um, go crazy, but but on the margin, if you're if you're a little over your equity long term targets, now is a wonderful opportunity to take some profits. Wait wait until uh, uh, wait and see if uh, if Kamala Harris uh, uh, concedes uh, and give it a month. But then 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 uh, take then some take your off the table. <laughs> Um, well, I've had, you know, the, the the successful capital managers who come with this program, and you have done this in the past as well, really do emphasize this part about position sizing, right, which is, you know, create the diversified portfolio, have your target position sizes, and then, you know, be diligent about trimming them back when they do what you hope they will do, which is they they outperform and great, but, but turn those gains into real gains and then still keep your core position. You're nodding vigorously as I'm saying this. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but rebalancing is one of the most uh, powerful and often underappreciated source of return in your portfolio. So um, first I wanna thank you, Chris, for being so specific. Um, and this is an audience of investors and they're always looking for ideas to go research and you, you gave a lot of specific asset classes. So thank you for that. Um, uh, uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, helping people build wealth when you and I have talked in the past, um, you've done a, a very good job of, um, you know, saying, Hey, you know, for, for a lot of people, <clears throat> um, it, it's not so much about getting, you know, this year's performance in the market, right. Um, it's really about, uh, applying these time honored, um, best practices for wealth wealth building and then applying them over time, right? So um, you've given a lot more time to this in the past, so I don't want to have you do it all over again, but um, you've given a great formula, which I just want to, I want to share again with people, um, especially for people that are younger and just starting out with their careers, which is you've said, look, you're going to do pretty well if you, if you early in life start following this strategy. And it was invest a third of your income each month Right. So be diligent about not overspending and, and capturing a good chunk of what you make and, and putting it aside, um, putting it in a diversified portfolio of domestic and international stocks and bonds, real estate, commodities and other assets. And then each month um, put money into it, you know, put a third of your income that you made that month into it. But look at those assets in your portfolio and very simple formula. Look at the one that performed the least well over the past month. And feed it in, into that one. Just and, a just just a little bit of a fine tune on that. Sure. Uh, I I don't I wouldn't look at which one did. I would ignore the performance of the last month. Okay. I, I would say. Look at the portfolio and which one is the lowest in the portfolio. Let's say you choose ten asset classes. I like ten asset classes because I have ten fingers and toes. But there's nothing. Uh, magic about 10. It could be six, it could be eight, it could be 12, but uh, pick pick a number and equal weight them. Make sure that there's balance. You know, you want uh, 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 a number of growth type asset classes and some defensive type asset classes, but, uh, and, and people can find elsewhere my 10 uh, ETF, you know, kind of portfolio, but look at which one of your 10 uh, ETFs has the lowest current value in the portfolio and buy that one. And feed that one. Okay, right. great. Thank you. A very helpful clarification. Okay, so feed that one. That obviously is going to change from month to month, right? Right. Um, but over time, you'll be keeping them all relatively, you know, you'll in the be same you'll be automatically rebalancing and averaging in. Yeah, and averaging in very important. Um, and then you do that for decades, hopefully, right? Um, and by four or five, time, you know, the the, the youngsters will uh, uh, live longer than you and I, likely. So you know, maybe five decades. 
Okay. So, yep. So if you're smart enough, to, if you're lucky enough to be hearing this when you're a teenager, do this for five decades, um, you're going to do pretty well, right? With, with uh, compounding and, and uh, you know, the, the, the growth of these assets, their historic growth rates, right? Uh, will outperform. Um, and then you'll be sitting on a nice pile in your portfolio by your, around the time that you want to think about retiring. And then you basically do this in reverse, right? right. Where every month you just look at, whichever one is biggest and you take a withdrawal from that right and you keep doing that for basically the rest of your life right sure and i'll give you the 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 chris's simple formula actually i have to i have to uh, i have to credit my uh partner rob arnott for this one um if you want to know when you retire how much should i pull out of my portfolio the answer is estimate conservatively how long you're going to live. You know, let's say you tire at 70 and you think that uh, you want to be conservative and you want to not outlive your money. So you'll say a hundred. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I probably am not going to live past a hundred. Uh, if I do, you know, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it, mm -hmm. but uh, so that the number is 30. So whatever you've accumulated in your retirement savings, divide by 30. That's how much you can spend each year. And well, you'd say, well, what about investment earnings? Well, yeah, you're going to have some investment earnings, but you're also going to have some expenses and some taxes. And, you know, I, I, I just divide by 30 and, uh, and then divide by 12. And that's how much you can spend on a month. And every month go to the portfolio and pull, you know, uh, the, the one twelfth of the uh, uh, annual amount that you can pull out of your portfolio, which is how many years do you have to die divided by what you have today uh, and, uh, you know, make an automatic transfer from your brokerage account to your checking account uh, and sell the uh, asset class that has the highest value. Well, what I love about this is its simplicity, um, and I'm, I'm sure the challenge is just being disciplined and getting it all done. But you know, folks, if you're if you're looking for a simple DIY way to do it, it doesn't get any simpler than this. And if you're looking for advice from an expert in capital management, they don't get much better than Chris Brightman. Chris, thank you so much for joining us here. For folks that would like to follow you and your work um, between your here and your next uh, appearance on this channel, where should they go? Researchaffiliates.com. All right. And uh, when I edit this, uh, I will put up the URL right there on the screen, Chris, so folks know where to go. Folks, I'll also have a link to it down below, along with a link to Chris's piece on immigration. Um, Chris, it's just been wonderful. Um, really look forward to having you back on in the future, especially, you know, I, I asked you that question about, you know, when, when do you think um, the reckoning may happen? I know nobody really knows, but if you start seeing warning signs that it's coming sooner rather than later, please come back on this channel as soon as you can. Thank you. Well, all right. Well, now's the time of the program. We bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial. Um, they'll react to their key takeaways from the discussion I just had there with uh, Chris Brightman. Um, and then we'll also talk about uh, you know what's been catching their attention in the markets over the past week. I'm joined as usual by lead partners, John Lodra and Mike Preston. Guys, thanks for joining me. Mike, why don't we start with you? Um, any key uh, key points that really stuck out with you in the discussion there with Chris? Hey, Adam, there's so much in this talk. I've got a long list of notes. Let me just hit a couple of high points here from uh, Chris Brightman at Research Affiliates. Uh, Chris said he was optimistic on the economy, and he talked a lot about in innovation, and innovation is accelerating. And I think most of us can see that in the financial markets, but he's he's more concerned about valuations. And he sees <clears throat> the fact that we'll probably have a disappointing decade ahead, and even Goldman agrees with this, and they talked about 3% nominal returns. Those are nominal returns. So subtracting inflation from that, you may have near zero real returns, particularly if you know, inflation is around 3%. Right now, the bond market is predicting two, two something inflation over the next 10 years. He talked about um, immigration, how immigration has helped real GDP particularly illegal immigration. And he talked a little bit about the immigration problem and how, um, you know, how we have an illegal immigration problem and how that's probably going to be addressed during the next administration. You know, one would maybe guess uh, that that might be, a, that might be a more strict policy if Trump is elected versus Harris, but either, <clears throat> either side would probably clamp down on illegal immigration. 
And if you think it through, and I liked how he explained it, it will be a, a pretty major hit to GDP. He talked about how GDP doesn't necessarily translate directly to the equity market. You could have you know, them going in opposite directions. And he even hinted that you know, uh, there, there's often times where they're inversely correlated. So I don't know that a hit the GDP will uh, will necessarily be a a um, a doom signal for the market. But what he talked about was seven percent of GDP. Um, seven percent of GDP. We're running seven percent GDP deficits even with a booming economy, and that piece was pretty shocking to me. And here we are in a bubble. The 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 economy is booming. And we're still running 7% GDP deficits. And, you know, that is the debts growing by almost 3 trillion a year, 2, 3 trillion a year. So that's a major warning sign. And it should be a hindrance to growth going forward, particularly at these valuations. When you asked him, just a couple more things, I guess I'd, I'd say, you asked him, where are we in the story? Where are we in the game? He said, we're past the seventh inning stretch. So not only evaluations bad, we've got 7% deficits, GDP. Um, we and we're we're very late in the game, so be careful. He talked about tips being a potential good investment. We've talked about them a lot and looked at them. We haven't put them in the portfolio yet, mainly because we think that we may get a deflationary scare first if we get an asset price crash. So therefore, we haven't been in tips yet. But I can't argue that tips is probably a decent place to be if you have to set it and forget it, go into some type of investment for the next ten or twenty years and forget about it. That could potentially be a good place to be. And, um, you know, he had a neat little calculation at the end about how to withdraw money from your account. And that is, you know, if you're going to live 30 years, take, you know, one thirtieth of it over the, each year. And I suppose what he's getting at there is that the growth component could potentially offset, uh, offset expenses and inflation. That's not really far off from what we think withdrawal rate should be, normally around 4%. And I guess that would translate to a 25-year retirement given his formula. So... But overall, I think there's a lot of agreement there. Um, I like the fact that he's optimistic, but overall, I think he agrees with us about being pessimistic about future returns based on where the market is and where valuations are. So with that, I'll pause. All right. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I talked with Chris for a few minutes after we, we, we uh, he hopped off. And, um, you know, one of the things he, he mentioned is, is, you know, as he said, you know, right now we're sort of exhausting all of our options. So, you know, this is kind of trying to continue the status quo for as long as we can, even though we know it has an expiration date on it, right? You know, you come up with whatever analogy you want, feasting on your seed corn or whatever, right? You know, it works for a while, but then you end up with a much bigger problem at the end. Uh, so he said, we're still in the middle of doing that. And, um, but um, what kind of gives him confidence that this reckoning is indeed going to happen is there are some pretty big um, milestones coming up um, when you look at things like Social Security, when you look at things like the entitlement programs, um, you know, there are there are projections. It's it's math. It's not that hard uh, that basically, are, you know, you do the math and you say, look, Social Security is going to basically be, you know, uh, out of money by the early 2030s um, at, at current rates. Right. Um, you can make some similar forecasts with a lot of uh, Medicare uh, spending. Um, and those are, you know, the two biggest uh, expenditures uh, that the government has. And so, um, you know, Chris is just saying, look, you know, it, it, we can continue on the path we're on up until the point the market says, look, you're close enough to this big deadline that we're now getting concerned. You're not going to you're doing nothing to fix it and address it. And therefore, we're going to have to start changing the game here. And this is when you would expect to see bond yields going through the roof, credit spreads exploding. Um, it's basically the financial market, um, you know, kind of abandoning confidence in, in the ruling party. Um, now, he says, I don't know when that's going to happen, <laughs> but I can tell you the closer you get to those deadlines, the probability of that happening begins to increase dramatically. So this is why it'll be so important to you know, keep tracking on a regular basis, which is what we'll do on this channel over the coming years, where we are in the story. You know, as, as a lot of the folks uh, who appear on here, Lance Roberts being a big one, Say, you know, valuations are they're they're a terrible timing mechanism because the markets can remain irrationally valued longer than than you can remain solvent in many cases, as the old saying goes. Um, but uh, they tell you kind of the, the general threat level 
And then, you know, there are some timers in the story, like, uh, like Chris just mentioned there, where we can keep an eye on where we are in terms of proximity to those things. And again, we can't say that markets might not have, you know, four great years from here. Uh, they, they could, as Chris said, it's not his default assumption, but, but he sees that they could. But we know that the closer we get to some of these big deadlines, uh, the higher probability that reality is going to have to force its way in here at some point. So that, you know, I, I think can inform capital allocations. Um, and the reason why I mention all this is while Chris mentioned a lot of issues, he is not saying sell everything today and go into bunker mode. Um, he's just saying play the game we got. But the closer we get to some of these unresolved issues, that's when you want to start lightening up uh, and putting more and more defense into your portfolio. Um, John, uh, I, I, I heard you guys say that some of your short-term indicators um, are beginning to, I don't want to say flash big warnings, but 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 flash some caution right now that may make you guys having uh, doing a little bit of trimming in your portfolio. Is that true? Yeah, that's right, Ed. And we uh, so we obviously are very cognizant of valuations, and Mike and I and our team certainly appreciate when a when a money manager, someone who's managing assets, and and Chris, your guest there. Is I forget how many billions of of capital you you indicated that his his team's research is is fueling, but it's a whole different um, proposition to talk about things when you're actually got clients' money on the line. So we appreciate his his comments there. So yeah, the valuations certainly are are something that drive our overall positioning. We're much less invested in equities right now than we otherwise would be if we were at more kind valuations. But um, the momentum and, and various indicators that we follow, which lead us to be uh, in the short term, much more constructive on equities than we otherwise would be. Uh, we look at a lot of different metrics. We're not big fans of kind of what we call light switch indicators. You know, one kind of technical analysis indicator or tool that is meant to be a, you know, kind of a on and off switch because it's way more nuanced than that. And, and you know, we've learned through our careers when you, when you kind of put so much emphasis in one indicator or a very small, narrow range of indicators, you tend to get whipsawed a lot because that's the nature of how these markets work. So we look at a lot of different indicators, uh, breadth indicators, uh, and I'll, hopefully I'll cut through some of the jargon, but breadth indicators are just a measure of how, uh, participatory the broad market is in trends, whether they're up uptrends or downtrends. For example, in, in um, 2023, it was a very narrow market. We talked about it ad nauseum here about the thing, you know, the Mag 7 stocks being the only show in town. Not really the only show in town, but the point being, it was a very narrow market. This year, however, has been a very broad and broadening mar market, which is a very, in a vacuum, a healthy thing, right? So we look at breadth indicators. We look at... Um, you know, price signal indicators, buy and sell signals, trend, you know, trend breakdowns, trends, trend breakouts. And we look at them over ranges of time frames, short term. So, for example, we'll look at, um, you know, percentage of stocks within a given bucket or, or index that are trading above their 50 day moving average. Right. And that's a shorter term indicator as compared to, for example, the percentage of, of stocks that are trading at or above their 200 day moving average. That's a much slower more intermediate things. So we look at the, the range of these kinds of broad-based indicators across different time frames, and some of our shorter term indicators, the percentage of stocks above 50-day moving average is starting to kind of deteriorate. Bullish percents, which are a, a measure of the percentage of stocks in a given index or basket that we look at, uh, are starting to kind of uh, erode. And these are, these are signs that there's a, a, a weighing that's kind of starting to, to underneath the surface of the market um, show a, a slowdown in participation. It's not, not by no means is it a run for the hills kind of thing, but it is something that we um, take with some discipline. And it's not a, not a game of perfection, but it's about probabilities engaging likelihoods, right? And so, you know, in recent uh, days, we've seen, seen some of this fall through to the downside. We did trim back our equity exposure a, a little bit, about two and a half percent just today. Uh, in our weakest sector, you know, we, we where we do have allocations, we want to be in those sectors that are exhibiting relative strength, either going up more durably and more sustainably relative to their peers, or declining at a slower rate uh, relative to one's peers. That, those are the kinds of places you want to be when you're kind of calling for best ideas. So, so those are the kinds of things that we take action on. Certainly, if if we see a follow through on some more meaningfully. Um, you know, kind of indicative, you know, indicators of, of broader weakness, you know, we'll take further, uh, you know, action to reduce equity exposure. We do have uh, hedges in place, uh, both 
covered call hedges, as well as some out of the money put options. We have a lot of things we can do to, to tighten or adjust those hedges as these indicators you know, uh, might suggest, but we don't have to anticipate. We can, uh, and, and I think um, your guest, Chris, you know, kind of talking about, you know, sometimes it, like, for example, looking at GDP as an indicator, you're looking in the rear view mirror, right? So we don't have to anticipate. We can kind of look at, at what the market is telling us right here and now uh, to help navigate in, in the context of a, a viciously overvalued market that deserves every bit of, of care and caution uh, as possible. All right. Um, well, really well said there, John. Mike, I want to come to you real quick because um, speaking of valuations, um, uh, gold, which is uh, an asset that you were drawing a lot of attention to at the beginning of this year, saying that you, you thought gold could really have a breakout year. Well, that's come true. Uh, and on the day we're talking, gold is hit, hitting yet another all-time high. Um, first, again, just want to give you kudos for... Um, uh, you know, your your efforts to wake people up about this seem to have really borne fruit. Um, how are you guys at New Harbor dealing with gold at its all-time high right now? I mean, besides just being happy about it, um, are you guys increasingly beginning to, to put some hedges um, against your gold positions, assuming that, hey, at some point here, given how aggressively it's run, there could be some pullback? Uh, are you just letting it ride? How are you dealing with the record run in gold right now? Yeah, so let me just kind of um, clarify what our position on <clears throat> gold and silver is, gold, precious metals, and miners. We have long suggested that people have bullion exposure, first and foremost. Bullion in the form of coins or bars or that type of thing. Ideally, in physical possession. So we recommend 5 to 10% gold and silver bullion. Many people have gold only, and that's okay. Some people have silver only, and that's okay. If we had our druthers, I'd say that somewhere around two-thirds gold and one-third silver would be best. So that's gold and silver bullion in your possession or in a depository. That is really the long-term investment or hedge or whatever you want to call it. People own these things for various different reasons, but it became clear to us a bunch of years ago that we were going to be facing some kind of end game with you know, fake money printing where the world started to realize that that was the scheme. And so that's what we recommend. And we don't really recommend trading out of that. I would say that some of our clients and the people that we talk to that are not our clients as well might have a much higher position than that, sometimes as much as 50 or 75 or even 100%. For those people, we would be dollar cost averaging out of the bullion into a into a smaller position, something less than 20%. But having said that, gold and silver have been amongst the best performing asset classes that you could just blindly put your faith in. Gold itself has an incredible chart. We've been talking about the chart ad nauseum here over the a bunch of years. And um, I think I will go ahead and just share it quickly just so we can take a look at it here together. This gold chart, this is a monthly chart, and this is just of GLD, which is the widely held ETF. And so back here is the 2011 high, then we went through 10 years of consolidation, and then four long years of sideways movement. And look at the monthlies here. We had this big breakout, a three-month triangle consolidation, and then four more months. And here we are up at 2,700 or so. I actually didn't look at the the uh, the latest spot, but it's right around there, 2,700. So this type of parabolic move, some might say is unsustainable, and it might be, but I don't think so. I think this breakout is real, and it's very, very tricky to pick a top. The best you can do if you're overweighted to the sector is to come up with a plan to sell into the up move because you're never going to pick the top. And really, for those people that are overweighted, the whole point is to have this and, and help it fund their lives so I would say start dollar cost averaging out maybe here in the high 2000s, 2,800 to maybe 3,000. Although I think gold will hit 3,500 from here. And there's no saying how high it can go long term. And so there's really no overhead resistance. Silver is starting to do the same. You know, silver here, silver on the monthly chart. It's it's got this old high back here, back in 2011, which was 50. Right now, we're at around 35. So a lot of people think we might close that gap between 35 and 50 quickly. I don't know. I think that these lines here that I had put on here before are, are the rough stopping points. We're kind of past that first one in the 34 to 35 range. We might go a few dollars higher and then 
kind of go sideways. But that's how we look at gold and silver. It should be five, maybe 10% bullion long-term in your possession. If you've got a heck of a lot more, start dollar cost averaging out. But lastly, let me talk about the miners because GDX here has been a little bit disappointing. And we've talked in the last bunch of weeks about how at these prices that these gold miners should be printing money, right? At $2,800 gold, there's a leverage effect that flows down to the profits of these companies. We should see some upside surprises, and that's what we were hoping to see. And we were thinking that that would be the spark that lifted these miners really into some kind of short covering vertical move. It hasn't happened yet. Unfortunately, Newmont Mining came out the other day, and the, and the results were a little bit underwhelming, so to speak. And Newmont actually had a pretty sharp sell-off from about $58 a share to $48 a share. And what we don't know here quite yet is if this is a one-off situation or if this is a warning for the whole sector. Um, I'd say the next biggest, or at least up there in the top three in terms of mining uh, is Ang Angaco Eagle Mines, AEM is the symbol. They're reporting tonight. So let's see what happens. I still expect that we're going to start to see some positive earnings surprises, and that will light a fire under the miners, and we should see a sharp move higher to, for them to catch up to the bullion. We'll see, because as we just showed you on the charts, gold is up again today, yet miners are down. You know, So there's this early disappointment in the miners. So the next week is going to be pretty important for the miners. Adam, I'll just, um, I'll just, add, on to, I'll just add on to, to Mike's uh comments there. So we, we have about a 10% model allocation to, to gold mining stocks. We actually trimmed exposure uh, a few weeks ago in, into the quite a large, you know, GDX, for example, as a proxy for the space went from mid mid 20s to um, low 40s, right? And still right now trading around 41. So we use that pretty large run to, to rebalance our, our portfolios, to book some profits, scale back to our target allocation of 10%. And that 10% allocation we have right now, we do have hedges of some form on about two, uh, three quarters of that 10%. So about seven and a half percent we have hedged you know, with, with plenty of upside still uh, allowing in there, but we do have some downside hedges if if, we, if this falters from here. Getting a little worried about, you know, the, much of the theme of the last couple of years has been the utter dis disgust of the retail sector and most buyers in, in precious metals and kind of the stealthy rise of, of metal prices. Uh, and central banks really being the only real buyers. Um, of late, we've seen some more, you know, meaningful flows and maybe even concerning on a short-term basis. You look at some of the inflows on some of the retail traded products and there were some massive inflows, for example, last week. That's a short-term contrarian thing that has us a little bit on edge about the, the near-term price movement. But the bigger picture is, is and, you know, I, I think with the fiscal situation, still very much a... Um, a referendum on uh you know a, a pretty tricky situation fiscally and also the the specter of you know inflation kind of coming back if 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 the fed policies on interest rates are are too too lax and the market so far is seemingly voting that you know bonds have sold out pretty pretty hard here on, on that that uh kind of suite of 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 factors and uh but we're watching things quite close but um you know happy to have that core allocation in a real important space Okay, and, and to, my, to my question, the way that you guys are sort of um, hedging against uh, gold being at right now at, at an all-time high after a long run um, is uh, you're doing um, some position resizing, as uh, as Chris was saying, is always wise to do, right? You're taking some of your gains off the table, um, but obviously you you have your hedges on the position, right? So that's your insurance, your downside insurance, and presumably, John, you guys are raising the floor of those hedges. Uh, as they mature, as gold continues to go up, meaning the higher gold goes and the more you're able to raise your hedges, that if there is a correction, your insurance is kicking in at a higher price. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we we had put options on GEX, for example, in the, the high 20s, if you go back several months ago, uh, we now have some put options uh, at, in the high 30s, just under, you know, about $38 a share, frankly, on GEX right now. So it's you know not a whole lot of downside from from there, and that's on half of the position. And we have sold some you know recent call options to bring in premium, both to pay for those put options, but also on the balance of the position about another half of another quarter of the position we took in some just call option premium because we did think in the short term we were getting a little little overextended and we wanted to kind of you know buffer a pullback that that was increasingly likely. 
Yeah, well, that, that's great. And guys, I appreciate you being so transparent. And this is a big reason why I have you on the channel every week is so that people can see how a professional uh, you know, money manager is basically you know, playing this from a risk-adjusted standpoint. Um, and as we've talked about in the past, you know, if you understand hedging and can use it defensively, it can be a great way to protect downside risk in your portfolio. Um, all right, we only got a couple minutes left. Mike, just real quick, just we'll spend a minute on it now, and then we can talk more depth about it next week if you want to. But um, I, I just saw you guys uh, last week. I was at your event in uh, Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But you mentioned at the event that you guys had just added Bitcoin to your portfolio, correct? Shocking as it is, yes, we did add Bitcoin. It's a very modest position. It's a 1% model weight. But, um, and I wouldn't call it capitulation. I would call it acknowledgement that it's clear to us that the, the data is that Bitcoin is here to stay, that and we know the blockchain is a fantastic invention and it's in, it's good, and it is used and can be used for many other things besides just transactions. But it's really... It's really more the chart pattern and the fact that we broke out of a downtrend here uh, in Bitcoin. And we've actually gone higher since we added that 1% position. We're trading at around 71 or 72,000 here, just just shy of an all-time high. Yesterday, it looked like we were going to hit an all-time high. We backed off from there. So it's a typical pattern that we look for in all assets. We look for a basing pattern, a so-called cup and handle pattern, pattern the, the gold chart that I just showed you had one of the best examples of that that I've ever seen over a long-term time frame. But Bitcoin, too, has had that over the last few years. And it seems to be rising in tandem with gold and silver. There seems to be this creeping in awareness of the market that you know, maybe this money printing environment won't last forever. At least that's the way that we look at it. So, and the final piece of evidence was the the basing pattern, the the handle, and then then the breakout higher of this downtrend pattern. And so, because of this breakout, we believe that we would go not only to new highs, but somewhere in the range of ninety to hundred thousand on Bitcoin. And so, you know, we could debate all day long about the the merits of Bitcoin and whether it will ever be used as a currency. I don't think it's really going to be used as a currency, but it does seem to be. A, a very good store of value. We talked about that at the conference. And for all those reasons, we added it. We don't want to take a big position. And I we understand that won't even make a big difference, even if it hits the target that we're talking about. But still, if it goes up 50% and we added 1%, it adds something to portfolios and it gives us an entree. And we could very well add on to it later. We'll see. But um, with the advent of some ETFs last year, I think it was actually early this year, maybe late last year on some of them, there's a whole bunch of very low cost ETFs out there that make it easy for the average person to get in there. And we, all, we, we manage thousands of accounts and to be able to put a position on for all those people without them having to open up wallets and you know, either hardware wallets or online wallets and go through all of that. It's pretty amazing. I understand that it's better to own an asset. Like we talk about with gold and silver own it. But in this case, for us to get everyone in just a little bit, we thought made sense. So we did that. We talked about that a lot at the conference, and maybe you'll talk a little bit more about the conference. We just want to thank you, Adam, for flying all the way out to Concord, Massachusetts to join us last week. We had a great group of people, and we had a, you know, we talked about a lot of different things, and we even had a nice historical guided walk afterwards. <laughs> so thank you so much. We had a great day. Yeah, no, it was a wonderful event. Uh, I really enjoyed the um uh, the, the walking tour and, and the historical lessons that we got through that. And I talked a bit about them in last week's uh, weekly market recap on Saturday. Um, and, you know, I was, in, I don't know how many folks know this, I was an archaeology major uh, in college, archaeology and pre-med, as weird as that combination sounds. But I love history. And of course, growing up in Massachusetts, it was great to, to um, you know, uh, learn even even more than I, I, uh, I learned some stuff I hadn't learned growing up there. So it was fantastic, um, as well as going to the uh, the famous uh, Authors Ridge there, where you've got uh, the great literary greats from the transcendentalist movement like Emerson and Thoreau, Alcott and uh, Hawthorne. Uh, there, it's just fantastic to walk in their footsteps. But it was a great event. Thank you guys for putting it on for inviting me. Um, learned a lot. Um, more importantly, met a lot of great people. And just wanted to thank you guys for, for letting me be there because um, I, I love going to live events. I don't get the chance to do it very often. And when there's a high concentration of folks that watch this channel like there were there, 
um, I really get some of the, the best um, uh, opportunities to really put my finger on the pulse of what people care most about, the topics they want to hear discovered, uh, discussed, uh, the guests that they want to see on the program, um, you know, the personal challenges that they're facing, you know, definitely heard a lot of people um, express a lot of frustration uh, about um, both current markets and how they're operating, um, a lot of frustration about how uh, our leaders, both the central planners and our elected authorities seem to be running us uh, in directions that people don't feel are, are sustainable. And I a thousand percent agree. Uh, a lot of people just trying to plan, you know, for their retirements or for the futures of their families and feeling really kind of under threat uh, in doing so because they, 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 they have to play the markets that we have right now, but they, they believe in their hearts this game plan isn't going to last for very long because it's not sustainable. And I think Chris Brightman basically just said the same thing, just a lot more smarter than, than I did. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's really helpful to help me determine how to improve this platform and the type of interviews we do, the type of guests we have, the type of topics we focus on because of that, uh, that feedback from real folks. So anyways, wonderful day, wonderful time, wonderful people. Thank you for that. Uh, John, any, any, I'll let you kind of land the plane here. Um, any, wrapping up points about that or anything else we've talked about before we clock off for next week? Well, I'll just add my thanks, Adam, for you coming all the way across the country to, to join us. Look, um, as much as we are fascinated by and challenged by the study of markets and, and the hands-on management of money, it's all about the, the people, our clients, as, as individuals, as, as human beings, and the fear and emotions. And uh, there's no better way to connect with our clients than in person like that. We were Humbled that we had clients come, you know, all the way to Massachusetts from as far as North Carolina and California, and of course, you know, some more local folks. And local could have been a five-hour car drive. So really humbling, and um, we really appreciate. You know, it really kind of makes reminds us not that we need reminding, you know, of the 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 very humble privilege we have to do what we do because it's it's about people and uh, tricky times, and and uh, you know, we we try to just bring it back to their human level. And, and uh, there's no better way to do that than in person like we did. Oh, thanks. You, you said it well. And yeah, it really reminds you of the day. It's not about your job isn't about money. Your job's about yeah. about people's lives. Um, and uh, anyways, I, it, kudos to you too. Uh, seeing uh, what big fans of yours, your clients are, especially your longest serving clients, um, was a bigger testament to just the quality of service and, and stewardship that you guys do than anything that, than I could have ever said. So anyways, uh, wonderful event. Folks, if you're watching and um, you know, you'd know you like some help in uh, you know navigating your portfolios uh, ahead of here, um, given all the issues that Chris Brightman and I just talked about um, and with, with, you know, like the, the expertise and the help of a firm like these guys who we're talking here, um, highly recommend that you reach out to a good financial advisor, professional financial advisor, and one who understands all the macro issues that Chris and I talked about and all the experts and I talk about on this channel. Um, if you've got a good one who's doing that for you, great, stick with them. But if you don't, or you'd like a second opinion from one who, who fits those criteria, then consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Thoughtful Money endorses. To do that, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com, fill out the short form there. You may even be connected with John and Mike and their team there at New Harbor if you want to be. These consultations are a reminder, they're totally free. There's no commitment attached. There's no, no strings attached to it all. It's just a free public service that these firms offer to help as many people as possible, make as informed decisions as possible about what to do with their money to prepare for what might be coming down the road. John and Mike, thanks so much again, guys, for another great week. Um, again, really fun to see you in person. Hope we do something like that again soon. Uh, and everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thank you so much, Adam. See you next week. Thanks again, Adam. See you soon. Have a great day.